good evening. I am Dr. Kay Taylor, and I am the Director of Education here at the Space and Rocket Center. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight for a very special Pass the Torch lecture, Dr. Robert Zuman. Um, our Pass the Torch lecture series is a public education program that we have here at the Rocket Center where we feature important ideas and discoveries about uh, space exploration's history and space exploration's future. Tonight we have a, a great <coughs> speech in order for you, in store for you, but I would like to turn this over to our host that helped bring this to the Rocket Center, and this is Dr. Wayne McCain, who is with AIAA and Athens State University. Um, at Athens State, he has been a, um, a faculty member and advisor for the student branch. He has over 40 years experience in the collegiate ranks and over 30 years experience in college teaching. Um, his areas of expertise include propulsion, systems engineering, and risk management. And he is a certified project management professional and an associate fellow of AIAA. He's a strong supporter of Humans to Mars and also worked at uh, Martin Marietta Denver, where he uh, worked with our guest speaker, Dr. Zubert, um, and helped originate the Mars Direct mission concept. Uh, he currently has a book in the works that outlines the top-level hum uh, Human to Mars mission using an enhanced Falcon Heavy as a launch vehicle. He also is keenly interested in radio astronomy, flying, scuba diving, and supporting the Alabama Academy of, S of S Science and STEAM. Um, he is a, a family man. He is a dog lover. He is firmly believes that the glass should always be less than full, only to be topped in situ, and I believe that's what he's going to help provide tonight. So, if you would, a round of applause for <coughs> Dr. Wayne McCain. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Well, I'm really glad to see such a great turnout tonight. Uh, I hope uh, everyone in the community uh, understands how fortunate we are to have Dr. Zubrin here. For many of you, he needs no introduction. Most of us, or a lot of us, have followed his ideas and thoughts about human space flight for the last 30 years or so. But of late, uh, after he did his uh, Mars Direct book, where he really uh, outlined a new way of thinking about how to get to Mars and solved many of the problems that had kept humans from Mars for many decades, he has gone on now to recognize the significant changes in the commercial space industry and how that opens up an entire uh, future for mankind that's unlimited, really. So it's not about me tonight. It's about Dr. Zubrin and his ideas about how humans can buy an insurance policy for the human race by being multi-planetary species. That's, that's basically it. Um, Dr. Zubrin is founder and president of Pioneer Astronautics out in Colorado. He founded the Mars Society, which is uh, several decades strong in exploring the ideas of how to get to Mars, with what equipment, uh, all the details. Uh, Dr. Zubrin is recognized worldwide as an expert in this area. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Robert Zubrin. Thank you. So thank you for that kind introduction and thanks to all of you for uh, turning out to hear what I have to say and even more for what uh, many of you are actually doing, um, which is working towards this. Uh, and uh, as I, I'll try to explain uh, in this talk, I, I think that this is absolutely critical for, for the human future, and it's certainly the activity that is going on in the world at this time that is going to be most remembered by future ages. So, um, 
topic is the case for space, how the revolution in space flight opens a future of limitless possibility. The revolution, the future, limitless possibility, that's three big subjects. I won't have time to talk at all in a talk of a half hour or so. Uh, but fortunately, I have written a book on the subject, and after the talk, if you think what I have to say is interesting, they're out there on the table, you buy them, I'll sign them, it's a win-win situation. So, first, the revolution. You're looking at February 2018, and that's recent enough that many of you probably saw this happen on the day that it happened. Um, this is incredible, and, and, and to give you some perspective on it, because uh, many, not all of you may know the background on this, in 2010, the Obama administration put together a blue ribbon panel headed by Norm Augustine, the former CEO of the company that Wayne and I used to work for, uh, Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, um, to examine whether uh, President Bush's uh, uh, moon program could be carried off within the funds that would reasonably be available. And the committee looked at it and came to the conclusion that it was impossible because, in their view, developing a heavy lift vehicle would take 12 years and cost $36 billion. SpaceX did it in six for less than $1 billion in development cost. And to cap it all, the thing is three quarters reusable. So in doing this, what they not only did, I mean, they introduced a very interesting and, 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 and useful aerospace system, but they did more than that. They proved a point, which is that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial organization to do things in one-third the time at one-tenth the cost than has been considered normal in the aerospace industry, at least in recent decades. And furthermore, even do things that were deemed completely impossible altogether. And because they proved that point, uh, and of course they began proving this point even earlier uh, with the Falcon 9s, um, they have ignited a international entrepreneurial space race, which has incorporated not only other people of Musk's general type, such as Jeff Bezos with his Blue Origin and Richard Branson with his Virgin Galactic, but even working engineers are getting hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to create new space launch companies. I'll talk about that in a minute. And, um, well, I'll talk about it now, actually. Uh, there's another one going to orbit. This is Rocket Lab. Okay, this was not founded by a billionaire. This was founded by a working engineer of ordinary means and many people in this room, uh, but who got $300 million in investment. And they are delivering payloads to orbit. This is not space flakes saying they're going to go to space at science fiction conventions. This is real. And the the uh, and and this is a New Zealand company. New Zealand doesn't even have a space program. So New Zealand has reached orbit, not through a government agency or government space program, but through a private citizen. Okay? And, and, and this is happening worldwide. So the entrepreneurial space race is not only opening this thing up to different uh, kinds of people, it's opening up to people of any nation, including ones that do not have sizable or even any space program. Okay, there's a company in Ukraine, and so, I mean, and so on. And now, this is going to create a competitive dynamic. It already has, and, and there's another interesting point. Look, in Space Age began in 1957, Sputnik, beep, beep, and 12 years later, we were on the moon, okay? And there was enormous progress done in that period, much of which you can see documented in this hall right outside of this room. In those 12 years, we went from zero space capability 
to landing people on the moon, multi-stage, heavy lift rockets, hydrogen oxygen engines, in space life support, space suits, lunar rovers, space rendezvous techniques, lunar landing techniques, re-entry techniques, deep space navigation, deep space communication. The whole bag of tricks, okay, was developed. And the space launch, which was incredibly expensive in the late 50s, by 1969, had cost of space launch had fallen to $10,000 a kilogram, where it stayed for the next 40 years. Okay, very rapid progress in the 60s, but then after that, stagnation, it, 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 not in every area, but in the most important areas, in particular space launch. And the, the, but since 2009, the cost of space launch has dropped by a factor of five. From 10,000 a kilogram to 2,000 a kilogram. That is extraordinary. So it's like, you know, the ancients, they had their classical age, and that was pretty impressive, but then there was the dark ages, and now is the Renaissance. Okay, we're out of the dark ages, and things are happening really fast. Okay, now, the cheaper space launch gets, the more launches there are going to be. Okay, that's basic economics. You make something cheaper, the more people are going to buy it. Okay, the more launches there are, the faster spacecraft technology is going to advance. Both because there are more launches, more chances to try new things, but also, very importantly, because if launches are cheaper, spacecraft designers to be less conservative. Okay. For decades, the standard wisdom in the aerospace industry and spacecraft design is don't use something that hasn't been used before. Okay? Because the thing is costing billions of dollars to get up there and you don't want it to fail just because you're trying to improve this little part over here and use a better radio. Why not just use the one that worked last time? So this is like a person who won't see any movies he hasn't seen before. He doesn't want to see a bad one. Okay, so that's... You know, it's it, The Wizard of Oz, he saw that as a kid, it's a good movie, it's a very good movie, okay? Um, but, that's all you're ever willing to see, you're not going to see a lot of movies, okay? The, um, so, th there it is. Um, but now, you're going to have a lot more experimentation, much faster advance in spacecraft technology, and, in fact, um, well, there's an additional factor here, a second revolution, which is not a product of Musk at all, but, well, but of the general advance in electronics, which of course has gone on. Uh, and now we have satellites that can, uh, 10 kilogram satellites that can do things that used to take 1,000 kilogram satellite to do. And so these are much cheaper to launch, and in fact, they're also cheaper to build themselves. Okay, and so now you have very capable satellites. I mean, these CubeSats started out as, as just little educational projects, you know, little, you know, one liter size Sputniks that would orbit the Earth and go beam and students would actually see something happen. But now, I mean, they, they, they're doing capable missions. Two of them went to Mars and relayed the uh, entry, descent, and landing data of the inside probe in 2018. Okay. Um, and so now you have satellites that don't cost a hundred billion dollars or a billion dollars, they cost a couple of million dollars. Okay, and uh, be very cheap to launch. And what this means is not just superpowers, not just Fortune 500 companies, but even medium sized businesses and universities will be able to conduct space missions. Right. Now, Last year, 2018, there were about 100 satellite launches in the whole world. Okay, SpaceX got 24 of them, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. A quarter of the whole world market by one medium-sized company. Okay. Um, but with the cost of launch going down, there's going to be more launches. So pretty soon, we're going to start to see 200, 300 launches a year. But if we really want to get the cost of space travel down, to make it something like air travel, okay? Okay, now, now Musk, by the way, as, as I think people here know, is already, even though he's got the cheapest launch system there, there is, he's 
trying to advance his technology and make his current systems obsolete. He's got this thing called the Starship, which, if it is successful, will cut the cost of launch down to about $700 a click. All right, well, that's pretty amazing against the $10,000 number we've been used to. Okay, but, you know, air travel, you buy an airplane ticket to somewhere, and typically it might be $500, and maybe you're 100 kilograms counting your luggage. Okay, that's $5 a kilogram. How, how do we get things down to that kind of cost? Okay, so that you can just go places in space, like I just flew here from Denver today and I'm flying home tomorrow. Um, now, where's that? I don't think that you can do that with satellite launches alone, okay? Because, I mean, just think about it this way. Um, if, if SpaceX wanted to drop its cost of launch by a factor of 100 from $700 a kilogram to $7 a kilogram, which would get it to the air travel range, um, and they didn't hire any new people and pay for any new buildings or anything, just to break even at that price, they'd have to have 100 times as many launches. Even if they could do all launches with no additional cost. Okay, so that, that and obviously it would take more money, they have more launches than that to do that. Because there would be additional costs. Okay. How do you get from 100 launches a year, not to 200, but to 10,000? What's, what's the market for that? Okay. Well, I think there is such a market, and it's point-to-point -point travel. You know, for thousands of years, people have made money on the Earth's ocean. And some people have made money by actually extracting wealth from the ocean, for, by fishing, for example. Um, but actually far, far more money has been made not by trying to extract wealth from the ocean, but by using the ocean as a low drag medium of transport from point to point on Earth. The ocean is a low drag medium connecting every port to every port. And it is maritime commerce, which has been where the real money has been, not fishing. Okay. Um, and, um, well, space is a global ocean of zero drag, connecting every point to every point on Earth. Um, and uh, if you can use it, you can travel from anywhere to anywhere on Earth in less than an hour. Now, obviously, point-to-point -point travel on Earth with expendable launch vehicles is, is a non-starter. But with reusable launch vehicles, it becomes um, conceivable. And uh, now, one interesting thing about the SpaceX Starship, which is a two-stage launch vehicle, the first stage returns to the pad, the second stage would go to orbit, or therefore it could go to anywhere else on Earth, uh, is it uses methane oxygen propellant. Now, I've been an advocate of methane oxygen propellant for a long time, because it's the easiest propellant to make on Mars. And if you want to do a Mars mission, you want to do it with rockets that you can make the return propellant on Mars readily. It's also a very attractive propellant from a performance point of view. But there's another feature of methane oxygen propellant that makes it particularly interesting for point-to-point -point travel on Earth, which is it's the cheapest propellant there is. Okay. Methane as a fuel is about a quarter of the cost of kerosene, okay? um, and vastly cheaper than hydrocarbons. Um, could I ask you, sir, if you would? Um, the, um, now, if you're using expendable rockets, it hardly matters whether your fuel costs, you know, uh, 25 cents a gallon, or $2.50 a gallon, or $250 a gallon. Okay, because regardless of the cost of the hardware, it's going to be vastly more. But if you're using a reusable launch vehicle, um, or, or aircraft, uh, fuel costs do matter. They matter a lot. And I've actually worked the numbers on 
um, using the Starship to transport um, 100 passengers, say, from Los Angeles to Sydney. Um, and that it works out to about $20,000 a ticket. Now, I've never bought an airplane ticket for $20,000, okay? Um, but there are people that do. Right now, the cost of a first-class airplane ticket from Los Angeles to Sydney is $20,000. And there are people that do it. And the um, uh, uh, and the only thing they get for the extra cash is a free drink, a tablecloth, and a bigger chair. They still have to spend, you know, 18 hours in the plane, just like you and me. Well, here, you get there in an hour, you'd have uh, half an hour of zero gravity and a view of space out the window of the plane. Um, so, I think there's a sale there. And then once these things get going, they'll get even cheaper. Um, just as air travel, uh, which was once a province only for the elites, uh, has now become something that a lot of people do. Um, okay, and that means cheap access to orbit. These vehicles are basically orbital vehicles. And, you know, as I say, a hundred satellite launches every year, hundreds of intercontinental flights every hour in the world. It's a vastly larger market. And the same things can go to orbit, which means things like orbital labs, even orbital industries, orbital hotels all become um, possibilities. Now, but what about going beyond geocentric space? Well, of course, if you have cheap space launch, we can talk about um, not only expeditions to the moon and Mars, but settlement. But, I mean, let's now return to the here and now. How does this uh, space launch revolution affect the NASA space program? Well, NASA has two different modes of operation. It has a purpose-driven mode, and it has a vendor-driven mode. Purpose-driven mode is exemplified by the manned space program in the 60s, Apollo, as well as the science program, the planetary uh, probes and the space telescopes and such, then and ever since, down to today. Okay? Those programs have made epic accomplishments. Okay? Even though sometimes things cost more than they should, they're spending money to do things, and what they've done is epic. But it does have another mode, which is a vendor-driven. Okay, where you don't spend money to do things, you do things to spend money. Okay, and this creates distortion. So, for example, as you may have heard, um, NASA currently has an initiative to return people to the moon by 2024. And here's the plan. Okay, this is the Artemis plan. Okay. Uh, and uh, it requires four launches, five flight elements, and six rendezvous operations per mission. Okay. So it is able to give a piece of the action to practically every interested party, all the stakeholders, as they're called, uh, merely by dropping the constraint of uh, a requirement for mission success. Um, This is absurd, okay? Um, however, the, if we do take advantage of these new capabilities properly, um, we can achieve extraordinary economies. And uh, it's in the book. Some of you have read my articles on this plan that I'm advocating, known as Moon Direct. Um, I'll just describe it briefly here. Uh, I can't describe it adequately this talk, but you have a couple of launches of a heavy lift vehicle, and, and here I'm showing Falcon heavies because they're flying now. Um, you could also use SLS for this, okay, but um, Falcon heavy can deliver 60 tons to Earth orbit, which means 10 tons to the surface of the moon if you're using hydrogen oxygen. Propellant. SLS um, could do about 50% more than that, albeit at much higher cost, about 10 times as much cost 50% more payload, it can do 90 tons to orbit, which is 15 tons to the moon. 
So you do a couple of launches of them, and you launch, and you land some, uh, you have a heavy cargo lander, if you've seen Falcon Heavy, so it would be 10 ton half modules, and then one went to the moon. If it was SLS, you could do 15 tons. Um, okay, so now you've got a couple of houses sitting waiting for you on, um, in the craters there. And by the way, the third revolution here is the our increased knowledge of places in space, in particular the Moon and Mars. And this has come from the official space programs. Okay, we have discovered water in shadow craters near the south pole of the Moon. We discovered vast quantities of water on Mars. Glaciers on Mars as far south as 38 degrees north, which is the same latitude as San Francisco on Earth. And these glaciers are covered by just a foot or two of dust. They are within a shovel distance of the surface, and they contain pure water ice, and they have more water in them than the American Great Lakes. So we have found materials on the moon and Mars that we can turn into resources, uh, and we also have to take advantage of that. The Apollo 11 upper stage, including the actual cabin with its life support system, which was made of 1960s materials, including the 1,000 pounds of avionics. Okay, with less capability than your phone. Okay, um, the, the, it had a dry mass of two tons. Now, I'm saying we can build such a thing, except instead of having a storable stage, it has a hydrogen oxygen stage with a delta V capability of four kilometers, uh, excuse me, of six kilometers a second. Six kilometers a second is a magic number for moon missions. Because six kilometers a second is the delta V needed to go from low Earth orbit and land on the surface of the moon. Or alternatively, go from the surface of the moon on direct trans Earth injection and propulsively capture in Earth orbit. Okay? Six kilometers a second with hydrogen oxygen propellant is a mass ratio of four. It means that the vehicle with its propellant will weigh four times as much as the vehicle with empty tanks. So if the vehicle dry weighs two tons, the vehicle wet weighs eight tons. Remember, our lander can deliver 10 tons to the surface of the moon. So it can deliver a lunar excursion vehicle with its propellant enough to fly home. So we use the heavy lift vehicle to bring one of those to orbit. We use a Falcon 9, very cheap launch vehicle, which is now very proven to deliver a crew to low Earth orbit in a Dragon. They rendezvous in Earth orbit, transfer the crew from the Dragon to the lunar excursion vehicle, and then the cargo lander delivers the crew in its lunar excursion vehicle to the lunar surface near the HAV modules. The crew then exits this, can go set up the house, uh, get the base going, everything's been pre-landed, and then they go off to the crater to try to get uh, lunar propellant making operational. But this mission does not depend on lunar propellant. This mission is going with only Earth propellant. Its purpose is to get lunar propellant making operation. Okay. Um, then when it's time to come home, they get in the lunar excursion vehicle, they fly back and propulsively capture in Earth orbit where they can rendezvous with a Dragon or an Orion or Soyuz or the space station or Sierra Nevada's vehicle or what have you, uh, which then takes them down to the surface of the Earth. Now, after a number of these second phase missions have occurred, we do have lunar propellant operational, at which point the lunar architecture simplifies greatly, where they will refuel and then fly back to Earth orbit, get in a Dragon or other capsule and land. So the recurring mission here, instead of requiring four launches, one of which is a heavy lift launch vehicle, it requires one launch of a medium lift launch vehicle. SLS, at most you'll be able to do one a year. Falcons right now are being launched at a rate of one every two weeks. So you talk about order of magnitude, more capability at an order of magnitude, less cost. And here, by the way, is my idea on how we can get water out of the crater. Um, the, the problem with the water in the crater, it's permanently shadowed. There's no solar power here. 
So unless you have a nuke on the back of a truck that you can bring in here, you don't have any power. I would beam power into the crater. Okay. Now, people here may have heard about visionary concepts for transmitting electrical power from space from giant geosynchronous satellites at altitudes of 40,000 kilometers, beaming gigawatts of power, receiving it on Earth, turning it into electricity, and selling it at a lower price than someone can get from uh, a, a gas-powered uh, turbine or a windmill or anything. And I think that's pretty out there, okay? But here, we're not beaming it 40,000 kilometers, we're beaming it 10 kilometers. We're not turning it into electricity, we're just reflecting it down into the ground to warm the ground, okay, to vaporize stuff out of the ground, which can then be condensed and trucked out of the crater, okay. And so it's tens of kilometers, it's uh, kilowatts instead of gigawatts, it doesn't require conversion, it certainly doesn't require uh, uh, being cheaper than uh, an existing commercial power source. Uh, so this is a very good initial application for power beaming in space. And you want to be able to beam power in space because you don't want to be stringing electrical lines across the moon. You know, require a lot of mass. Uh, now Mars, okay, um, I've given many talks on my Mars direct plan, but basically the way I do a Mars mission, the way I would do a Mars mission, is with two launches of a heavy lift vehicle. Okay, the first one shoots shoots to Mars a Earth return vehicle with no one in it, which makes its return propellant methane and oxygen out of Martian carbon dioxide, which is in the atmosphere, and Martian water, which we now know is abundant. Once this is done, then the next launch vehicle shoots to Mars uh, a HAB module with a crew of four, five, six people in it. They land near the Earth return vehicle, use this as your house on Mars, and then after a year and a half of exploring Mars, you get in the Earth return vehicle fly back to Earth. You leave your habitat behind on Mars. Each time you do this, you add another habitat to the base. And before you know it, you've um, created the beginning of the human settlement on a new world. Now, let me actually just make one other point about my lunar architecture. You'll notice that it only uses a heavy lift vehicle in the initial stages. That is to say, before a lunar propellant is available. Once lunar propellant is available, it no longer needs a heavy lift vehicle. So maybe the masses are not as good. At not I can can't build this as light as I would like, and you have to use SLS instead of Falcon Heavies for this phase. Fine, you use them for this, but then you don't need them for this anymore, and you liberate them to be used for more ambitious purposes anywhere. You do not. Let's put aside Starship for the moment. Okay, that's in development. And you're welcome to have whatever your view you like as to whether SpaceX will succeed in that because that's in the future and no one knows. But let's say it's SLS is the best you've got. If it's the best you've got, you don't want to tie it up. My analogy is think of the Normandy landing. You take that beach with the best combat divisions you have. But once the beach is taken, it can be administered by rear echelon units, and your crack combat units can be liberated to liberate the rest of France. Okay, and that's how you do this. Okay, um, and then, well, to me, Mars is the goal that we really should be focusing on. Um, it's really where the science is. It's, it's, it's the Rosetta Stone for letting us know the truth about the prevalence and potential diversity of life in the universe. And it is far richer in materials that can be turned into resources than the moon. The moon does have water, it doesn't have carbon, and we are carbon-based life forms. We're made of carbon. Everything we eat is made of carbon. Everything we wear is made of carbon. Everything we use is either made of carbon or made with the help of carbon. Um, there's also nitrogen, I could go on, but um, it, it, for the coming age, of uh, the immediate age of space exploration, Mars compares to the moon as North America compared to Greenland in the previous European age of um, maritime exploration. Greenland was closer to Europe, Europeans got there first, 
but North America was far richer in potential. It was a place you could actually create a, a, a vibrant branch of civilization, not just the base. Okay. Um, now, uh, in the book, I also talk about other possibilities, mining asteroids, uh, developing the outer solar system. The outer solar system um, is rich in a material that could be an incredible resource. It's called helium-3. Now, there's some helium, there's no helium-3 on Earth. There is some helium-3 on the moon. Helium-3 is the ideal fuel for a fusion reactor. Okay? And um, it doesn't exist on Earth. And uh, now, fusion may seem to you to be something that's sort of uh, in left field here, but actually it isn't. Um, because, as a result of the entrepreneurial space revolution, an entrepreneurial fusion revolution has been ignited. Okay, that is, what has happened is, because of the success, in particular SpaceX, uh, a number of very large funds have taken a, a look at uh, fusion and said, well, gee, maybe the problem with fusion power which always seems to be in the future, never get there, is the same thing as cheap space launch. Maybe the problem wasn't fundamentally technical, maybe it's institutional. Maybe the way to develop this is with the entrepreneurial team. And I have to tell you, because I, I did some work in the fusion program in the 80s, I was at Los Alamos, and uh, I can always remember uh, a group lunch that we had, and the group leader said to us, no, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be in a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. Okay, and we all laughed at that. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. Right? But, um, and I think that may be over the top. But if not a couple of crackpots working in a garage, a startup working in a warehouse, yes. Okay? And these things, these companies have gotten hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. Here's Tri Alpha Energy over here in California, $500 million in investment. That's larger than the US government fusion program. And these guys are moving fast, okay? These guys are not people that have spent 20 years thinking of where they're gonna put the next experiment, which is, for example, what the Ida uh, program did. Um, the, you know, because uh, time is money, and, and there you have it. And both aerospace and fusion and anything like this. Uh, and they're happening. And, and the thing you need to understand about fusion is that, okay, most people think of fusion power as just another way to generate electricity, you know, like the lights. Well, it is that, yes, uh, but there's plenty of ways to make electricity. You can make it with coal or natural gas or solar power or nuclear fission or waterfalls or windmills or what have you. But fusion power is a new kind of power. It can do things that you can't do with a window. For instance, make fusion rockets. And a fusion rocket can get an exhaust velocity of 7% the speed of light. And unlike a electric thruster, it's not power limited, it makes its own power, like a chemical engine does. Okay. And a rocket engine can generally be engineered uh, to, a rocket vehicle can be engineered to get to a vehicle velocity up to about twice its exhaust velocity. So we're talking about vehicles that can exceed 10% of the speed of light, which means getting to nearby stars on time scales of decades. So we're talking about an introductory capability to interstellar travel. And that's what's in the offing here. Okay. And we'll talk about that and other means of advanced propulsion, as well as the potential for terraforming new worlds. This, which you're looking at here, is Mars. Uh, not the Mars of today, the Mars that has yet to be. Um, this Mars was once a warm and wet planet, and it can be made so again through human engineering uh, methods. In fact, the key thing is to warm it. We know how to warm planets with doing that. Um, and, uh, and if we really wanted to warm a planet by producing super greenhouse gases, and how to do it. Um, and this can be, and, and I think we will eventually do this because you see we're like, 
And it's the nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into places that are friendly for the development and propagation of life. That, that's what we do. That's why life on Earth has been a success. Life has radically transformed the Earth in the interest of life. Okay? And I mean, you know, the oxygen in our atmosphere is an artifact of life. The pre uh, uh, life Earth had no oxygen in its atmosphere. Uh, so this is a transformation. The soil on the continents is an artifact of life. In symbiotic communities of plants and animals, you know, have, have transformed the land and from the seashore, up the hills, up the mountains, as high as life can go, it goes. And, and no sooner does any barren place appear on Earth, but that life transforms it. You know, you think of uh, Hawaii coming out of the Pacific Ocean, this huge piece of sterile rock, and then birds fly over and drop seeds, and the place becomes lush, and Polynesians show up and bring in pigs and, and stuff like that, so it's something good to eat. And then Europeans show up and build nice hotels, and it's a good place to check in. You know, th this is, is, is what we do, okay? And it would be, frankly, unnatural if, if, if we, uh, as the vanguard of life on Earth, did not do this with Mars, and then to planets around other stars, because we are the bird, as it were, that uh, the biosphere has evolved to take the seeds of life from this planet to others. So we're not just going to bring life to Mars, we're going to bring Mars to life. Um, so I talk about all this, but in the final third of the book, I devote myself to talking about why it is essential that we seize this moment, that we seize this opportunity. Why must we open? Space. And I give a number of reasons. And they're for the knowledge, for our survival, for the challenge, and for the future. Okay. And I'll, I'll briefly discuss some of them. Um, okay, for the knowledge. Okay, and this, of course, is one that NASA does uh, put out there uh, correctly as one of its great products, which is. Knowledge, revolutionizing our knowledge of cosmos and of science. Okay, so here, this is uh, that that's uh, Sarah Seeger, astronomer, and she's presenting the uh, bottom line results of the Kepler Space Telescope mission. This is just a year ago, uh, and the bottom line is one in five stars has an Earth-sized planet in its habitable zone. That's a very different picture of the universe. 10 years ago, the same thing before that. Um, the universe is filled with life. And astronomy, more broadly, uh, has led in the development of much of science, in particular physics. I mean, most of our knowledge of physics actually came from astronomy. We learned about gravitation and the classical physics through astronomy. Okay, much of electromagnetism through astronomy, relativity through astronomy. Nuclear fusion discovered through astronomy. Okay? And the reason why we make these discoveries in physics through astronomy is because the universe is the biggest and best lab that there is. Okay? And you, you, you dispose of the far more uh, phenomenon and forces than you could ever create in a lab you have to pay for yourself. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the knowledge of life, which we're going to get by going to Mars. See, look. All Earth life is the same at the biochemical level. That is, we all use the same alphabet for transmitting information from generation to generation, RNA and DNA. Whether it's bacteria, mushrooms, oak trees, crocodiles, or people, it's all the same alphabet, essentially the same language. Okay? So, but is that the language of life? We, pay, we use the Latin alphabet, so do the French, so do the Spanish, so do the Germans, okay? With some minor variations, a few letters in different, different ways, but it's pretty much the same alphabet. But the Chinese use a totally different alphabet, which does not have a common origin that we share with the Germans and the French. Uh, it, it is a totally separate origin. It works on entirely different principles. And the language itself works on entirely different than in the European language. And the and what's life? Life is um, 
nanotechnology, we hear about nanotechnology, the stuff we produce in machines. That's what life is. Okay? And if you can uh, have greater capabilities of controlling that, in other words, if you can control the alternative uh, nanotechnologies, the, the powers over nature inherent in that are, are phenomenal. Um, okay, and then there's our survival. Now, you know, um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize about Earth, even though we live here, is where it is. The Earth is in space. The Earth is in space. Okay. Now, and the thing about things that are flying around in space is they're constantly hitting each other. Okay? There's all this flight traffic flying around in space, and we're hitting other things that are flying around in space. And these events can be quite consequential. They have repeatedly caused mass extinctions on Earth, as well as global destruction of considerable size. Um, and of course, they had dinosaurs at 65 million years ago. So, okay, well, that's 65 million years ago. It's been a while. Well, last December 18th, a small asteroid impacted in the Bering Sea between Alaska and Russia with the energy of 10 Hiroshima bombs. What were you doing that day? It's good you weren't in the Bering Sea. But the, um, we have to get control of this flight traffic. And we can do that only by becoming a spacefaring species. I, I do not have sympathy with the argument that some people have advanced that we need to go into space so that when the Earth is destroyed, we'll have some survivors somewhere else. No. We're not going into space to desert the Earth. We're going into space to protect the Earth. And that's how you have to do it. Okay, then there's the challenge. Um, this is a graph that shows the number of STEM graduates, science, education, math graduates, in the United States from 1960 to 90. What you can see here is in the 60s, the Apollo period, when we had a truly bold space program, the number of science graduates uh, tripled. That's huge. Okay, that, by the way, if people want to know what the payoff of the space program has been in order to benefit going to the moon, it's not Teflon or even solar panels, which did come from the space program. Okay? It's the science graduates. Because, I mean, youth loves adventure. The bold space program makes science the great adventure. Okay? You multiply your science graduates, it means you multiply your science innovation. Okay? And it's jobs, it's new technologies, um, it's new medical cures, uh, it's all of this. And I mean, and more importantly, I believe civilization is like individuals. We grow, we challenge ourselves, we study it, and we do not. Okay? And this is how you grow. And then finally, I, I want to talk about the future. Now, there's the far future, and that's worth talking about. Because I believe that if we do what we can do in this time, then, you know, 500 years from now, uh, there will be human civilizations, not just on Mars, but on thousands of planets orbiting nearby stars. New civilizations, new cultures, new languages, new literatures, vast arrays of contributions to science and technologies, new heroes, new tales of heroic deeds that will inspire people. Further. That is something grand and wonderful. And, and if you have it in your power to create something grand and wonderful, um, then you should. Okay? But this is, is more than that. Okay? Because your vision of the future, of the far future, affects what the immediate future is going to be. It shapes it. Ideas have consequences. Okay? Your idea of what the future looks like shapes what's going to happen next. Okay? You know, people talk about the danger to humanity, okay? Climate change, resource exhaustion, asteroid impacts. Well, okay, but did any of those things actually cause the major disasters of the 20th century? No. 
The major disasters of the 20th century, we had some real winners, uh, were caused by bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea in a multiple of variants. And that bad idea is that there isn't enough to go around. Okay? And if you believe that there isn't enough to go around, that everyone else is your enemy. You may make tactical alliances with various other people, but ultimately you're all enemies. Every nation is the enemy of every other nation, every race of every race. Uh, it, it, the world's a jungle. And, and, and this is what caused it. Okay, here, see this, this book, Germany and the Next War. This was an international bestseller published in 1912 by General Friedrich von Bernhardi, who was the chief intellectual of the German General Staff. Okay. And uh, in this book, he said, look, there's only so much to go around. So sooner or later, we, the Germans, are going to have to find out with the Russians to see who gets Eurasia. Okay. And should we have this war now or later? Well, clearly now, before they industrialize, we can take them down now. And, and by definition, if you're going to have to have it out with someone else sooner or later, it's going to be the benefit of one or the other party to be sooner. Okay. Um, so, 1914, two years later, they take advantage of the pretext of the assassination of the Archduke to initiate World War I, which is the, really the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century that set in motion all the rest, communism and fascism. That's World War II and so forth. Uh, but then World War II, yes, Hitler, even more hysterically, Germany needs living space. The laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so the better they live. That's a quote. Okay, the, this was all nonsense. Germany never actually needed living space. Germany today is considerably small in the Third Reich and has a much larger population and a vastly higher living standard, which they have obtained not by murdering people and stealing their land, but through technological progress brought about in part by Germans, but much more by people of all sorts of nations all over the world, including notably by a lot of people they were trying to exterminate. Okay. Um, so this was just insanity. And now today, I mean, I have to tell you, because I know I have spoken to them, that there are people in the American National Security Establishment in Washington, D.C., who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Because there's 1.3 billion of them, and if they had a standard of living like us, which they are trying to do, and they should try to do, then they'll, they'll all have cars like we do, and there won't be enough oil in the world. And you could bet your bottom dollar that they have opposite numbers in Beijing who look at the United States from the other side of the chessboard and think essentially exactly the same thing. And if this kind of thinking is a lot of prevail, we're headed for destruction, for mutual destruction. And it's pure nonsense. Okay? America's not China's enemy. The reason why China is progressing so rapidly right now is because of inventions made in the West. Okay? You know? Things like this, and this, and this, and that. Okay? But the reason why we have all these things actually is because things that were invented in China, like paper and printing and so forth. So the, the, uh, the actual human condition is not one of nations in a struggle for existence, but of a somewhat bumptious family of nations, each making contributions to expand the human prospect. But people don't see that. People don't see that even despite the manifest evidence. I mean, here, look at this graph. Okay, this graphs population against global GDP per capita. You know, the Malthusians say as the population goes up, the standard of living should go down because there's going to be less to go around. Okay, but that's exactly the opposite of what has occurred. As the world's population has gone up, the standard of living has gone up. Why? The standard of living is product per capita. Product per capita is determined by technology. Technology is created by inventors. The more inventions, the faster the rate of technological progress and inventions are cumulative. Okay? So 
the, the, that entire argument of the zero-sum world is exactly the opposite of the truth, but people don't see it. In fact, many people here, people my age or older, probably remember an outfit called the Club of Rome, a very prestigious organization uh, that in the early 70s published a book called The Limits to Growth, in which they had predictions on the human future. And, uh, and these predictions were completely authoritative because they had a computer to do their calculations. And, the, the, and what they predicted was that we basically run out of everything by the year 2000. Because there's this much oil, and we're using this much a year, and if you divide x by y, you come out with 35 years, and so 1997, it's gone, man. And the zinc will be gone, and the copper will be gone, and even the iron will be gone. It's all going to be gone. Okay, and you may disagree with this because maybe you're a Neanderthal from the Chamber of Commerce and wants to allow economic growth to continue, but obviously it can't. Well, the year 2000 has come and gone, and we haven't run out of anything. Okay, and okay, so haha, ha, Club of Rome is wrong. But here's the punchline of this joke. I don't know if it's that funny, but it is in a way. About 10 years ago, the Club of Rome had a reunion. And they published the proceedings of that conference, the Limits to Growth Revisited. And what they said was, some people think our predictions were wrong because they didn't come true. Naive people might think that, okay? But, they don't realize we had to be right. We are right. Okay, maybe we got a few years wrong. We didn't realize that some oil field here or there would be discovered or something. But, but we have to be ultimately right, okay, give or take, because there is only so much here, and sooner or later it's going to run out. And even though every time anyone's made a prediction of this character, it's always been false, okay, it seems on a certain logical level, to be self-evidently true. Sooner or later, it has to run out. There's only so much here. Now, but understanding that that is not true, okay, to understand that's not true, what you have to understand is there's no such thing as a natural resource at all. There's only natural raw materials. It is resourceful people that turn materials into resources. And that's why the more people, the more resources. Okay, but, to understand that, that's like trying to explain to a person who doesn't know that much about mathematics that there's an infinite number of points in a line segment. That takes a fairly sophisticated understanding of mathematics to understand that there's actually an infinite number of points in a line segment. Okay? To the average person, that, that does not appear to be evidently true. But anyone can see that there is an infinite number of points in a line that extends infinitely in both directions. Okay? And that's what space does. Okay? It's not a question of bringing back oil from Mars. No, we're not going to do that. We'll bring back inventions produced by Martian civilization. But no, we're not going to bring oil from Mars. But it will make clear that we're not living on the line segment, that we're living on a line that extends infinitely in all directions. And so it's not true that there's only so much on Earth because the Earth comes with an infinite sky. And that's the case for space. Thank you. Mars uh, much, once had a much thicker atmosphere, and it lost a lot of it because it doesn't have a magnetosphere. Okay, so you say, well, you could terraform Mars, but wouldn't you lose the atmosphere? Okay, well, the answer is you would, but it will take billions of years. Okay. Um, and the human race has only existed in its current form for a couple hundred thousand years, in any form for about a million years. Um, so that's a real long time. So basically, on the human time scale, if we terraform Mars, it stays terraformed. Any other questions about how to create a magnetosphere on Mars?
Uh, the, uh, okay, uh, look, the thing that is required, the fundamental thing is that one must insist that the NASA human program be purpose-driven, not vendor-driven. That's the fundamental problem. I mean, look, NASA's science program is purpose-driven. For example, they just launched the Test Space Telescope a year ago, and they launched it on a Falcon 9. They could have launched it on a Delta IV Heavy for only four times the cost, but they chose to launch it on a Falcon 9 so they could save $200 million, and you spend that on other missions or telescopes or whatever. Okay, so you say, well, gee, that, that's an obvious thing to do. Okay, well, if, basically, you have to insist that the human spaceflight program do the obvious thing to do. Okay, um, it, I mean, look, the gateway, I call it the toll booth. I mean, does anyone here believe for a minute that we would have reached the moon sooner in the 1960s if we had insisted on building a lunar orbiting space station first? I mean, that, that's totally absurd, okay? Um, and in fact, the, the gateway, so-called, um, was conceived of during the uh, Bolton tenure at NASA headquarters, and he was against going to the moon. And before that, by the way, they had conceived of another program, which they were insisting was necessary before we go to Mars, of putting a fragment of an asteroid in lunar orbit. Okay? And why? Because they wanted to have some place to go with Orion, and said, well, we'll go visit an asteroid in lunar orbit. Well, we'll put one in lunar orbit so we can visit it. Actually, you can visit an ast fragment of an asteroid the size of what they could put in lunar orbit at an, any major planetarium because they have meteors of about that size. Okay. But, and maybe we could launch one of those to low Earth orbit and visit it there. But the, the, um, they were just looking for something to do, okay? something to spend money on. If, uh, on the other hand, you say our goal okay, is to establish humans on the moon and then establish them. You look to do it the most efficient way you can. Now then, reasonable people can disagree on what is the most efficient way. Okay, because for example, someone might say, okay, your moon direct program, that's pretty, that's not how we did Apollo. I want to do it the way we did Apollo. And I disagree with that view, but I can respect it. That's a reasonable point of view. But gee, okay, why are we going to this weird lunar orbit with a space station? Well, because Orion is so heavy that SLS can't deliver it to low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home. But why use Orion? It weighs 26 tons. Dragon weighs 10. If you use Dragon as your capsule, and you could, Dragon is 50% larger than the Apollo capsule, okay. um, then SLS could deliver it to low lunar orbit with enough propellant to come home, as well as a small limb. So if you wanted to do Apollo that way, you could. Okay. You know, I don't think that's particularly imaginative, but it's rational. The other thing is just crazy, okay? And um, so the key is having insisting on a purpose-driven program, not a vendor-driven program. Well. Uh, Space nuclear power fission is something that is possible now. I mean, look, we had nuclear fission reactors before we had color television. Okay, so it's not that futuristic a technology. And the the and nuclear fission reactors uh, are close to essential for, for instance, establishing human uh, bases on Mars because uh, the solar power on Mars is only 40% that on Earth, and it's subject to interruption by dust storms. So uh, Mars missions are problematical without fission, and we should have a serious space nuclear power problem. Okay. Western civilization, in fact, the whole world was doing far better than it ever had in history. It was uh, prosperous beyond anyone's previous experience. And it, 
virtually destroyed itself. Um, but if you're talking more narrowly um, about Mars missions in particular, okay, um, well, three years ago I would answer you the entropy of the political class, the deterioration of the political class in this country, and its inability to carry off great designs. You know, the people that got us to the moon were the same people or the younger brothers of the people that won World War II. Okay? And they knew how to pull together as a nation to do grand projects, whether it was World War II or the Interstate Highway System or Manhattan Project going to the moon. Okay? Now, you do not have the same degree of public spirit uh, and the same degree of competence, the same... You don't have it. However, because of the uh, deterioration of the political class, um, a new force has entered the arena, which is this entrepreneurial space revolution, okay, which is basically has op opened an avenue to solve that problem, okay, uh, which previously was <laughs> really uh, a very formidable problem. And, I mean, look, the Musk and company are working on their Starship. Okay. There's going to be test flights late this year, next year. They're claiming they have the thing flying to orbit by 2021. Now, I, I actually do not believe that. I'm skeptical of that claim. But I really do believe that Starship will be flying to Earth orbit by 2024. And if we have, and the Starship is a fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicle in the Saturn V class. Okay. If we have that operational in 2024, somebody's elected president in 2024, he or she is going to ask their advisors, look at this, can we have people on Mars by the end of my second term? The answer is going to be yes. And uh, is it going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars? No. Tens of billions of dollars? Probably less than ten billion dollars. Well, then let's do this. Wow. Okay. So by making it feasible, by making it practical, the entrepreneurial revolution is going to make it sellable. Okay. Um, now, there are other things that get in the way. Okay, there's elements of the bureaucracy that can sabotage this. I mean, people may have noticed um, a couple of weeks ago there was this giant freak out by the planetary protection crowd over these people that had landed uh, a milligram of tardigrades on the moon. Right? Because it's a threat to the lunar biosphere. Um, okay. the planetary protection has got to go. I mean, you, you, you cannot do human Mars missions with planetary protection. It, it can't be done. Because you can never assure people that the spacecraft won't crash, in which case you're scattering you know, trillions of microbes all over the landscape. Okay. Um, so, but planetary protection is wrong. Okay. We do, spreading life to other worlds is not contamination. It's Enrichment. A, a, a living world is better than a dead world. Okay. Well, why favor sterility? Um, and sure, you can sterilize life detection experiments, but that's not planetary protection. That's just experimental rigor. Okay. Um, the, 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 uh, so there are things that can get in the way, but I think I'm, I'm very hopeful right now. Fundamentally, I, I, I think you know Musk. Okay, look, Musk is a risk. He skates right on the edge of the ice, you know? And he could fall off. Last year, he almost did with this stupid tweet that got him into trouble with the SEC, okay? Um, but at this point, Musk could fall off the edge of the ice. This revolution is going to go on. He's basically proven the point. The cats are out of the bag. I think, actually, that this is a considerably easier task than Apollo relative to our capabilities. Now look, in 1961, when Kennedy announced the Apollo program, we had 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience. We had not even reached orbit with people. We didn't know if humans could eat in space in, in, in May of 1961. Okay, and yet we developed all the systems and, and landed on the moon. Okay, I, I would say that we, we now have, in fact, uh, 80 or 90 percent of the technology we need to land on Mars. We need to develop a heavy Mars lander. Okay, and people are, oh, heavy Mars lander, we don't have
don't have one. Uh, and that's why we should build the gateway. No, actually, if you don't have a heavy Mars lander and you need one, you need to develop a heavy Mars lander. Okay. Um, you know, oh, that will require a parachute twice the diameter of any ever built. Well, please, okay, this is not Los Alamos 1943 here, it's a bigger parachute. This is something you can do, okay? Um, and yeah, so it's like building a bridge. It requires rigorous engineering. You've got to do it right. And there may even be some novel challenges with a particular bridge. But we know how to build suspension bridges. Well, here's the thing. Um, okay, what the gentleman is referencing is um, that uh, Elon Musk's current architecture that they talk about is they'll take the Starship and fly it all the way to Mars, refuel it there, and fly it all the way back. Um, and I disagree that that is the best way to use a Starship, um, because um, it increases the propellant requirements to send it home an order of magnitude compared to what is, is necessary. I mean, frankly, if I flew a Starship to Mars, I'd leave it on Mars. It would, I mean, why fly an apartment house to Mars and then send it back to Earth? We got houses here already. The, 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 so if I'm doing round trip Mars missions, I'd much rather send a much smaller return vehicle. Um, and so uh, the way I would use a Starship to accomplish Mars missions is just use it as a fully reusable heavy lift vehicle, lifting 150 tons to Earth orbit, and then stage off of it and deliver the payload elements to Mars, essentially the same way I, I do Mars Direct. Um, the, also, in addition to the fact that um, you have to make so much propellant to return a starship from Mars, if you go to Mars and come back, you're putting the starship out of action for three years. If you just use it as a reusable Earth-to-orbit vehicle, you can use it again the next week. So you get uh, far more use out of it. Okay? And in fact, between Mars uh, launch windows, you could be sending payloads to the moon and asteroids, building space industries, anything you want to do. So that, that's why I prefer to, to use it that way.